Okay. Okay. It's live. Is it on public? Yeah. Cool. All right. Here we have tonight before we start with our lesson another long awaited Hadith Disciple Critical Book Review. Hadith Disciple Critical Book Review. The work that we have with us tonight is called The Compendium of Knowledge and Wisdom. Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, translated by Abdul Samit Clark. It's called The Compendium of Knowledge and Wisdom. Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, translated by Abdul Samit Clark. We normally do book reviews on books that are actually written or wrote in English, authored in English by English-speaking people, whether they come from South Africa, the United Kingdom, South Ireland, uh, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, etc. People that speak English, uh, even in India, Pakistan, whatever the case may be. English-speaking people, English-speaking audiences that are normally the types of books that we review, teach, study, so on and so forth. And occasionally, from time to time, we do actual translations of books that pertain to our culture, the culture of Hadith, mm -hmm. Hadith culture. So this is the book that we chose to do tonight. It's not a book that's written originally in English, but it's a translation, a translation of a classic, and of a classical book. Classic and classical book. Huh? But we normally do books in which the author is actually writing and not just translating. Operation, whatever. Huh? However, due to the importance of the book and its uh, monumental status and its importance to the culture itself, the contribution, the addition to the Islamic library in general, like the Hadith library specifically. We chose to take it. Huh? So the name of the book is called The Compendium of Knowledge and Wisdom. The translation of the book in Arabic called Jamia Al Ulum Al Hikam. Fi Sharhi Khamsina Hadithan Min Jawami Al Kadi. Jamia Al Ulum Al Hikam. The collection, the compendium, gathering of Ulum sciences. Knowledge, what hikam, yambo hikma, and wisdoms, which explains 50 comprehensive iconic hadiths. 50 hadiths of the process of. In other words, before we start with the actual book here in front of us, is it a good book, is it a bad book, is it a good translation, is it a bad translation, etc. The book was written by this man, Ibn Rajab al Hamadi. We'll get into who he was, who he is, in which he explained 50 hadiths. And he called these hadiths to be jami'ah, thorough hadiths, comprehensive hadiths, deep, deep hadiths. A few lines, a few words, volumes of meanings, interpretations, principles, maxims that are extracted from these hadiths. this? And the original number of hadiths were 42. Some may say 43. Of Noe, I know a lot of half of, I know we. Uh -huh. And then Ibn Rajab, Allah, he came along and he added eight more hadiths or seven more hadiths to make a complete number of 50, khamsin. Uh -huh. He added eight more hadiths which he felt, which he thought, which he knew that were similar to the other 42 or 43 hadiths. Uh -huh. So he explained Noe's book and he also added to Noe's book. So he had 50 hadiths. Uh -huh. So that's the title of the book. That's the background and the origin of the book. 
And then that will get into the author, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he lived, when he died, etc. Before we read the excerpts, before we criticize the book, the translation, etc., we say that both in Arabic, the original work, and in English, are great books. Excellent books. The book in Arabic is a must for any Hadith disciple. If you don't have this book in your library, if you haven't read this book, if you haven't studied this book, read it numerous times, then you're not a true Hadith disciple. Jamil Ulum al Hikam Ibn Rajab is the bread and the butter. Huh? I'm saying this is the fish and the grits of breakfast. Huh? Ultimate breakfast. The ultimate book to have in your library and to read. There's no doubt about that. Ibn Rajab, when he wrote, how he wrote, the number of hadiths, athar, principles, fawaid, explanations, dripping with fawaid. So it's a book that you're going to have in your library all of the time. You're going to read this book on a daily basis. If you study Arabic and if you consider yourself to be a self-respecting student of knowledge, let alone a self-respecting disciple of hadith. And also, we have the book available in English. The same applies in English. No doubt about that. Am I doing this? So that's the book in Arabic. You must have this book. And this would be a book that you've read 5, 10, 20 times. If you consider yourself to be huh? self-respecting. A real student of it. Am I doing this? Standard reading. For Aqidah, for Fiqh, for Hadith, for Ilm, for Mustalah, for Takhrij, for Sir, Kullu Shaykh. It's in this book. And by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the author, Rahimah Allah, fulfilled the title. It is the, it is a compendium of knowledge and wisdom. So that's an Arabic. There's several different versions of the book which are available, huh? Tahqiqat of the book. If you can't get the actual book on it, then get the PDF. Get the what? PDF. PDF. Um, but, Mash, let's move forward. Uh, so we're not going to be criticizing and critiquing and reviewing the actual book itself. We're just going to be talking and dealing with the translation as we said before, we did a study of the book of uh, Sheikh Al-Bani, Rahimahullah, Al-Hadith, Hujjatun. Uh, the Hadith is approved by itself, and creed, and the law. We didn't critique the work of Al-Bani, we critiqued the what? The translation. Our channel is not made and specifically placed for Arabic books and slave Arabic books. Now, inshallah, we should serve people who are speaking and listen to English. Khair, inshallah. That doesn't mean we can't get any other thought from, from time to time talking and discussing the style of the book, but the asal of this review is what? Translation. Translation. Nah, no. Wisdom. English books. And this work we're dealing with tonight is a? English, English translation. 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 So we're going to deal with translation. And not necessarily critiquing, praising the author in Arabic. We gave you a brief background of the class. Yet, it's sufficient. So before we move any further, we say that the work we have in English is what? It's a good book. It's an excellent book. It's a very good work. That's the general what view or outlook of the book. Without the specifics, it's a what? It's a good book. And it's a good reading. It's something that you definitely would have in your library in English. All right, now let's take off this jacket or the sleeve. Whereas it gets in the way. And as you can see, you read it often or you move it, it gets what? Damaged. I only kept the sleeve on to show you guys. So you can see what it looks like on Amazon. In Dar es Salaam. You go slower now. Huh? Are you understand this? And there's a few things that we're going to read inside the sleeve as well. Let's get started. It says here, Torah Publishing aims to translate important reference works from the Islamic tradition to the English language and to advance the learning knowledge type. That's about Torah Publishing. We'll get started. It has other publications. Then on the back, it has the brief excerpt about the author. So, let's get started. As we said, the book is... Uh, Published by, you see the, uh, the tattoos of the book. Every hadith disciple wants to have what? Tattoos. Several tattoos. Your personal what? Tattoos. Books. Not just one, not just two, not just three, but what? Not just four. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like people get what? All over their body. And the more they have, the more they flaunt them and show them off. <laughs> now, we have, you guys have a what? Personal stamp, at least one. This is my book. This belongs to me. No one else. It's a part of my what? My library. Everybody understand this? Hey, so you know, practically the preach, right? Huh? 
Five and four. Groff Publishing. That's the publishing house. Copy, write, 1428-2007, Toroff Publishing, Mitchman Road, or Mitchman Road from the UK, from London, across the pond, as they say. Uh, the translator says, General Editor Yahya and Safira Batha, translation, Abdul Sami Clark, Arabic typed by Abdullah Ma'rufi, editors, Shams Adoha Muhammad, proofreader next, Muhammad Ansar, or Ansar. So therefore, the book was printed when? 2007. In the, it was published in the what? 1428. In the UK. Let's get started with the contents. Publisher's preface, introduction. Then it says, number one, intention. Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Islam is built on five. The decree, innovation, halal, haram, and ambivalent matters. Sincerity and counsel, fighting. The forbidden and the commanded, pure wholesome food, doubt, what does not concern one, loving for others what one loves for oneself, the blood of a Muslim, whoever has Iman and Allah in the last day, anger, excellence, of sin, talk of Allah, mindfulness of Allah, shame and modesty, istiqam of the obligations, purity is half of Iman, injustice, the wealthy and the poor, sadaqah, bib and ithim, talk of Allah, hearing and obedience, a comprehensive hadith on action, obligations, zuhd, going without, cause of harm or return to harm, claimants and counterclaimants, seeing something objectionable, Brotherhood, easing someone's distress, good and bad actions, optional acts, and lidaya. Mistakes, forgiveness, and coercion, being in the world as if a stranger. Desire, forgiveness, inheritance, breastfeeding, and kinship, the sale of all things, intoxicants, a full belly, hypocrisy, reliance on the law, remembrance of the law, index. Then we have the publisher's preface. It says here, uh, in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the comp and compassionate praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the worlds, and his blessings be upon his messenger. Allah bless him and give him peace. The seal of Prophet and his family and his companions on all those who follow him. Ibn Rajab al Hamadi was Zain of Deen, Abdul Rahman ibn Ahmad ibn Abdul Rahman, Rajab al Salami or Salami. He was born 736 after the Hijrah of 1335 of the Common Era. He died 795 of the Hijrah. He was died also 1392 of the Common Era. So that's when he was born and that's when he was what? When he died. In the medieval time period. It uh -huh. says here, um, was born in Damascus, Syria. The author was an expert of, on chains of net transmission, and this forms the initial part of the study of each hadith. That can be discussed, and we don't want to criticize it, we're just reading it, that's a problem in itself. Then he moves on to examine the various narrations, supporting narrations, and tip warnings, supplementary material from the campaigns, the followers are, and the followers of the followers, and the Salihun and Rulama up till his own day, as is the case with most of the works of, the works of major scholars. Ibn Rajab quotes from the great ulama of all the madhabs. We would like to acknowledge the work of the International Center for Islamic Studies of Australia and first commissioning this translation and, first, it, and, and its first major edit and to express our thanks to them for allowing us to honor, the honor of publishing it. Then after the work of the translator, we would in particular like to thank Maulana Shams Aduha for his painstaking work on editing the book and his sourcing the hadith which it comprises. And Muhammad Ansa for his proofreading and indexing, and Abdul Latif White Whitman for his layout and cover design. Mufti Abdullah Marufi for typing the Arabic, and Sheikh Muhammad Akram for his help on sourcing biographical material on Ibn Rajab. Yahya Batha. Right. Then after that is Ibn Rajab al Hamdi's introduction. Uh, let's move on to the back of the book of the sleeve. He gives a brief background of Ibn Rajab al Hamdi. It says, best known of, as Ibn Rajab, his full name. Our uh, titles are Al Imam Al Hafid, Abu Al Faraj, Zayn Al Din, Abd Rahman Ibn Ahmad Ibn Abd Rahman, known as Ibn Rajab, Ibn Al Hassan Ibn Muhammad Ibn Abd Abid Barakat, Masul Al Baghdadi, Al Dimashti, Al Hamdi, 736 to 795. Rajab was the nickname of his grandfather, and Abd Rahman perhaps because he was born in that month. Born in Baghdad, Ibn Rajab learned much from his father, who himself was a great scholar, then studied in Egypt and Damascus where he settled down until he died. Among his eminent teachers were Abu al-Fat, Muhammad ibn Muhammad, ibn Ibrahim al-Maydumi, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Khabaz, Ibrahim ibn Dawud al-Atar, Abu al-Haram al-Qarasani, etc. And he mentions here, he was a leading scholar of the Hamadi school. And he talks about some of the praise of the ulama, some of the books that he wrote. There's a brief biography of what? Of the Ibn Rajab al Hamadi. So we had to do a book report. A summary, you want to talk about Ibn Rajab, this should be a what? Bi 
brief, simple place. Hey, inshallah, a few cons on that as well. They didn't mention some of his big teachings like Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Qayyim was still in Ibn Qayyim. Uh, and there's no doubt whether you like Ibn Qayyim or not, whoever he was, Ibn Qayyim was the most famous of his teachers, hands down. No one was more famous, more infamous, and famous, huh? Both fame and infamy. Then what? Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Qayyim, of that time after Ibn Qayyim. There's no doubt about that. But moving forward. The author, uh, let's see, like, then, uh, then the, uh, the book goes on and it speaks on uh, Ibn Hajar's introduction. It says here, praise belongs to Allah who perfected the deen for us and made the blessings on us complete and who made our ummah and to Allah belongs to praise the best ummah. He sent among us a messenger from ourselves who sent his ayat to us, purifying us and teaching us the book and the wisdom. I praise him for his many blessings. I witness that there is no God but Allah alone is any partner. And this act of witnessing is the best protection of someone who seeks protection by it. I witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger, whom he sent as a mercy to all creatures. He made it obligatory for him to explain what has been sent down to us, and so he elucidated all the important matters for us. He sent them out with concise, comprehensive speech. Concise, comprehensive speech. It says here, so that he often expressed separate pieces of wisdom and sciences in one phrase, or in half a phrase. May Allah bless him and his companions with a blessing which will be a light for us in every darkness, and may he grant him such uh, much peace. All Allah, glorious is he, and exalted Saint Muhammad, so he said with concise, comprehensive speech. He sent him out to receive astonishing wisdoms, as has been narrated in the two Sahih books from Abu Huraira, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that said, I was sent with a concise, comprehensive speech. Azuhri Arab says here, Rahimahullah said, Concise, comprehensive speech, according to that which has reached us, is that Allah exalted is the He united many issues for Him, issues which used to be written in the books before Him separately, and one or two issues, and so on. Then He mentions more hadith, we're going to summary of the introduction, why He wrote the book, the importance of the book, the concept of the book, what's meant by Jawami or Kelly, concise, comprehensive speech, right? Definitely something to read. And as a further fact, that Every student of knowledge, whenever you buy a book, you should at least read two things. The introduction to the book and the index. The introduction to the book and what? An index. I understand this. One of my teachers in Medina, he taught me this. Every book that you have, at least read those two. Even if you just skim through the introduction, I'm him. Try to skim through at least or read the whole thing and look and skim through the what? The table of conscience and as to know what's in the book. So if someone comes over your library and says, wow, have you read all these books? My sheikh, and he says, yes, I have. <laughs> I know what's in every single book, and what? In general, some books, I've read all of them cover to cover, etc. So that's the introduction of Ibn Rajab al hamdali Allah, in which he speaks on what? The importance of the book, the concept of the book, the style of the book, the virtue, how he wrote it, I put together, Arabic terms, etc. Khair, inshallah. Right. So let's get started with the critique of the book. But we said that the book in general is what? Good book. Alhamdulillah. In general. It's a passing book. Pros. Number one. We say it's a smooth, fluid translation style. No big, hard, confusing words. It's not choppy. Mm -hmm. It's pretty generally what? Smooth. In general. Number two. Lack of lengthy and confusing footnotes. So books in English, they have so many footnotes that you get lost in the footnotes and you lose focus on the actual metin, the actual text on top. So some places it's good to put footnotes. Sometimes you may need to put lengthy footnotes. But sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes the footnote refutes and goes against the author and defeats the whole purpose of the book. Huh? And sometimes there may be issues that you wish to comment on, but you say that's not the style of this book. Here we just is what? Translation with basic, simple reference. It's not a shot, it's not a rut, a refutation, it's what? It's translation. So that's a good thing about the book. Number three is lack of confusing brackets and captions. Lack of confusing what? Brackets, brackets and captions. Number four is the professional uh, style of the print of the book. And we've explained this before. This, you may say, is insignificant. What is that? It's, it's, it's very significant. Because the books of Hadith are to be respected. They're to be given their value, their due worth. And we shouldn't have a cheap, choppy, flimsy, 
falling apart book. See this? It's quality. It's money that was put into this book being made. See this? I'm not the strongest brother here in this message. Uh -huh. But indeed, other books are what? Everyone trying to been written written by now. Everyone saying this? As a spy. It's quiet. I mean it's quality, huh? The pages, the type of the pages, the setting. Respect is given to the works of the Lord of Man. The classical works of the Lord of Man. That's some cheap, flimsy, throw together, paper plate service, huh? So that's a pro. And inshallah, but that goes back to the translator or the publisher or whatever. Uh, moving forward, I believe number five is the detail index in the back of the book. Alhamdulillah. Not the table of contents, but the what? Index. The index. Detail index. Names, places, sentences, concepts, huh? limits of a law, blameworthy in contracts. Mm -hmm. Very good index. And the more detailed index, the easier it is to find what? What you're looking for in a quick, efficient time, professionally, and a student of knowledge in English or in Arabic. The hadith to cycle in English or Arabic is to be what? Professional. Professional. When you do something for a living, when you do something all of the time, 25 8. Mm, call it. Not 24 7, but what? 25 8. 25 8. All day, every day. This is what you do with your life. And you need to master things. You need to have shortcuts. You need to have roads that save time, save energy. Save efforts because you have a thousand other books to read. So you may not have time to sit, but you need to find what you need to find. What? Quick. Am I understanding this? There's also time which you should actually look for what you're looking for. Tell you, let me know when you finish. Inshallah. Moving forward. Number six is a brief commentary and explanation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Brief commentary and explanation. Brief commentary and explanation. Occasionally, from time to time. They give what? Brief commentary in the footnotes. Not too often, but what? From time to time. Which is a good thing and also a bad thing. Hmm? Moving forward is objective translation. The translator, he doesn't refute the author. He doesn't translate how he wants to translate it, distort it. I don't, I don't know much about the translator, which I want to get into. That's a kind of the book. But the translator doesn't get into issues of dogma and hadith and shirk and that, that. Translation. And some translators, they do do this. Some translators, their hands are filthy. Their hands are dirty, nasty. And when they translate a book, they translate it to suit their Akhida. They translate it to suit their method. They distort and twist the words, play with what the author is saying to suit their agenda. That's dirty. That's not clean. Everybody understand this? In Arabic and in what? English. In English. People make tahqiq, tahqiq, tahqiq on the different books, and they talk about it really means this, blah, 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 blah. If the author is humbly in your Hanafi, translate the book as it should be translated. Don't translate it according to your method. Twist it so it can go with Abu Hanifah. No, 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 don't do that. Everybody understand this? If you're Ash'ari and he's Ahl Hadith, don't translate this name, this attribute to suit the Ash'ari creed. Everybody understand this? Khayyad and inshallah. These are some of the most important pros of the, of the book. Not all of them, but what? Some of the most important. Let's get to the cons. Number one. It's lack of mentioning what print was used. What book was used in Arabic? And we've discussed this many times in the classes, no? Was it the first print of the book? Tahqiq of Flan, Tahqiq of this one, Tahqiq. Whose book? Whose version? The versions of the book, they differ. There are vari variances, there are variations, there's discrepancies. Some manuscripts are more thorough than others. Some works in Arabic are more what? Thorough than others. You translate a book, where did you get it from? What volume, what print, what year, what company? You can leave us what? Totally what? In the dark. That is very bad. And as most books in fine English, this is the case. Bukhari, Ibn Kathir, Flan, they just translate it. They don't say anything. That is extremely unprofessional in Arabic, let alone in English. And shame on them, throw off publishing, say shame on them for not doing that. And that needs to be fixed and corrected in the next version of the book, inshallah. The next kind uh, of the book is who placed the chapter headings? Where do the chapter headings come from? Ibn Rajab, the translator, the editor, Mufti, Mawlana, Fulan, Fulan, who put them? Purity is half of Iman. I say that's a bad chapter, but who put them? Is that Ibn Rajab's speech? Did Ibn Rajab in Arabic put that on land or not? If he didn't place it there and you're putting it in a book, you know what? 
you transgress the boundaries is a translation. You have to put it in caption. You have to put a footnote. You have to put an introduction. We place a what? Headings. The headings are not from him, but from us. And if not, then that is one against the Aman. Writing a book, the tahqiq of a manuscript in Arabic, uh, translating a book, is something that needs a what? Aman. Is a trust, an ethical code, like doctors. What and what? Ethical code. You are not to go against that ethical code, so that's bad. Number three is, who is the translator? Who is Abdul son of Clark? Where does he study? Where did he learn English? Uh, English? Where did he learn Arabic? Where? Who? We don't know nothing about your man. It's very sad. Not saying that's a bad generation. Not saying that I know what he looks like and what he ate for breakfast. No. But we need some basic knowledge on what? Who the translator is. Everybody understand this? Very ugly mistake as well. Number four, sometimes you have an uncomplete commentary. Sometimes they start speaking on a thing, whether it's the editor or the translator, and then it just leaves it. And it's not thoroughly discussed. Either you want to deal with it or you're not going to deal with it. Don't leave the reader in suspense. No? Uh, number five is lack of information. Okay, let's, we'll suffice ourselves with four cons of the book. And as we said before, just because we have cons of the book doesn't mean it's a bad book. But is a critical what? Critical review. But let's move on to a notable quote from the translation. A notable quote. Page 119. Uh, excuse me, I forgot to mention how many pages the book is. It's over 800 pages, about 820 pages roughly. Page 119 says, This is a notable quote from the footnote. Speaking on the hadith number 7 of Nasiha. It says here, The word Nasiha and Nusr are synonyms in the Arabic language. They have very deep and broad meanings, as a result of which they are difficult to understand from a straight single word translation or even an Arabic synonym. Sincerity, in a very broad sense, is probably the closest English word that can be used, probably, according to them. This is because the Hadith commentators say that the underlying basis of Nasiha is ikhlas, i.e., sincerity, and in short, it can be interpreted as wishing the good welfare of another person. Wishing the good welfare of a what? Another person. Another person. Being transparent, winning good for your brother, advising your brother, talking to your brother, giving your brother his rights, the leader, the subject, anyone. You know, see how to the Quran, huh? What's made by? You know, see how towards the Quran and things like this. He says it's on the high up in the page. Doesn't mention that. This encompasses meanings such as good counsel, which is a common manifestation of Nasiha. Furthermore, Nasiha means different things in different contexts. As the forthcoming discussion will reveal that Nasiha towards the leaders is not the same as Nasiha towards the general public. And Nasiha towards Allah and his messenger is again different. In the comments of this hadith, sincerity will be generally used as the preferred translation for the words, while other meanings such as sincere, good counsel will be used where that is deemed appropriate to the context. Although this will be discussed in the forthcoming commentary, it will be useful for the reader to hear or to bear in mind the broad sense of the words from the outset ED. I guess that's the editor. That's not bad, come to that. It's good, it's beneficial in English. It could have been more thorough with regards to not seeing how it was the Quran, but it's good, alhamdulillah. But that's a little quote on page 119. There are many of them in the book, alhamdulillah. Now let's move on to some uh, specific errors, specific examples of sins of the translation. We gave the general sins, now we're going to talk about the what? Specific. specific points. So, you know, instead of just making this up, Specific things which we feel that the translator erred, or the editor erred, is which is a blunder. First is, which is a very bad blunder. Perhaps we'll read some things, maybe we've got enough time. On page one, or the first page, it says here what? Sorry, I'm flipping around. And it's very good to flip through the book. The more you flip through the book, the better you can what? get to know the book and the more things you find. It says here, where do we put this at? Not the publisher. This is weird.
Israel. One second, please. Inshallah, patience. Okay, here we go. It says here, for my mother, Fatima Betha, or Betha, I'm not aware of the proper term. I'm not seeing the word, excuse me. It says, Jannah lies beneath the feet of mothers, Ahmed and Nisai. It says, Paradise lies at the feet of what? Mothers. Of mothers. And then he says in this hadith, he doesn't say it's the same of a prophet, so the reader is supposed to automatically what? Think. No, and suppose there's a hadith, that's incorrect. Talk to somebody, is it thing or what? Okay. I don't teach it, huh? Says Ahmed and Nisai. Now, this is probably one of the most famous hadiths in English. Maybe not the most famous, but there are many. This is one of the most famous. No doubt about that. Top five, easy. Paradise is under the feet of what? Mothers. You may go to the supermarket. You may talk to your non-Muslim mother-in-law. Uh, Muslim here, they'll quote this hadith on you. Salah, beer, riba, hijab. Not important. But, mother, obey your mother, don't go overseas, don't do this, don't go to the masjid, shave your beard, etc. And they use this proof against you what? Paradise at the feet of the mothers. Everyone understand this? Do whatever your mother tells you to do. Don't do what she tells you not to do because? Paradise is under her feet. Everyone understand this? So, before we begin to say, is hadith authentic? Is it a hadith? But just the concept of how hadith is misused and abused. And all 50 other hadiths, the people just told you what? Disregard. It means nothing. The Prophet says, grow the beard. You don't take that, but you take paradise on the feet of the mothers. The Prophet Sallam says, do not obey. One of Allah's creatures, and now what she tells what? Disobedience. What happened to that? So people, they just play around with hadiths. Everybody understand this? They play around with what? Hadith. Hadiths, how they want to. Now, this is a hadith, famous hadith. And this hadith is extremely problematic. Hadith states that paradise is under the feet of the mothers. We'll read here with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala some more benefit with this with regards to this hadith. Uh, it says here, Al Jannatu Tahta Aqdam al Umahat. Man shitna adhalna wa man shitna akhrajna. The rest of the hadith says. Anyone that the mothers want to go to paradise, you go to paradise. And anyone whom the mothers don't want to go to paradise, what? They won't go to paradise. So your mother can just tell who goes and who doesn't go to Jannah. Catholic, Mushrik, Muslim. She's going to Jannah or not, but she has the total authority to do what? Choose. Extremely problematic. This hadith is fabricated. Rather, there's some people who may say that it has basis, no foundation whatsoever. Everybody understand this? Is the meaning of the hadith correct? Why would the person, the editor of the translator, whoever he was, mention a hadith like this? No reference, no nothing, just Ahmed and Nisai. That's firstly. Secondly, which makes it even worse, is the second black eye, the first jab, then cross, two black eyes now, is that he's confused and now he has compound ignorance because this is a different taqlij. Imam Ahmad and Imam Nisa'i reported another hadith, not this hadith. And I'll read it to you from its original source in the Arabic language. It's narrated by Muawiyah ibn Ha Jama'ah. Muawiyah ibn Jama'ah. And who jaa and Nabiya Sayyid Salam, or jaa and Nabiya Sayyid Salam, who called Yasullah, I want to an Abzu, who had jitu as the Shiruka, who called a Halla to whom, who called an Am, who called a Fazanha. فإن الجنة تحت رجليها رواه النسائي وغيره كالطبراني وصاحب الحاكم وارفقه الذهبي وقره المنذري. الحديث يقول أن هذا الكمبيان جاء إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وقال له: يا رسول الله، أريد أن أسألك رأيك. أريد أن أعرف ماذا كان يفعل في الله سبحانه وتعالى. النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال له: هل أنت مات؟ هل هي مات؟ قال له: نعم. قال له: فلزمها. قال له: اضربها مع والدتك. لا تتحدث. Don't go and fight, serve your mother. Because paradise is at her feet. Mothers or what? Mother. One mother. Your mother. This companion, believer, this type of jihad, not that paradise is under the feet of what? Mothers. The narration says, beneath her feet. And another version says, at her feet. In other words, your service, your dutiful obedience, your benevolence to your mothers, it means that we want to? Paradise. 
just as jihad and martyrdom is a means of paradise. Am I saying this? This is a hadith cut by Imam Ahmed. Cut by an Nisa'i, a Tawarani, so on and so on read. Not that other bogus baseless false hadith. That paradise is under the feet of the mothers. Whoever they will, whoever they choose not to, will, or not into paradise. So there's two problems that the author the mission. Why did he fall into these mistakes and these errors? Only Allah knows. But we say, from the reasons that are apparent to us, is that number one, he's not a specialist. We mentioned many books before, he isn't a what? A specialist. And when you're not a specialist, you fall into these blunders. So the job of someone who is not a specialist is to do what? Go to a specialist. Exactly. Yeah. Consult a specialist. Is to do what? So a specialist. I'm a master translator. I have degrees in English. So on and so forth. And in Arabic. But in Hadith, let me call up my friend. Assalamu alaikum. Nah, Sheikh Abdurrahman said and such. I have a book that I did. Could you mind looking at it, please, with your chance? Could you help me out with some Hadith? Could you send me some Hadith about my mother? Dedicated, so on and so forth. And this is what most people don't do. But when it comes to the dunya, they're sick, they're ailing, their problems. What's the first thing they do? Doctor. No, not just a doctor. Specialist. Specialist. Cardiologist. Optometrist. This one. Specialist. Someone who has in-depth, extensive knowledge on this field, this science. And that's what they ask. And they follow their advice and their expertise. Muslims, on the other hand, we feel we can just do and say whatever we want. And this is dangerous. Now you're lying on the prophet says something. And you're making an inaccuracy. So that's very bad. Everybody this. Moving forward with the next specific error or specific sin of the book, and it's probably the last one I will mention, page 445. There are many, not that many, but a few. We only mentioned a few. It says here, Hadith number 28, Taqwa, hearing and obedience. It says in the footnotes, the, it says the Khulafa mentioned here have two attributes, Rashidin. They take the right way. And Mahdiyin, they are rightly guided. Thus, the Khulafa Rashidin are literally the Khulafa who took the right way translator. What does that mean? That's first thing. And secondly, what is the fate of that? You just mentioned that they what? They take the right way and they're rightly guided. Then it says that they literally mean that they are those who took the right way. What sense does that make? Everyone say this? And this is what we mentioned at the beginning of the book. Some footnotes are what? Incomplete. Everybody coming in? This is a brief example. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it's something that's like, makes you spin. Like, what's the fact of that? Everybody say this? Khayyam, inshallah, In general, the translation of the book is pretty good. It's pretty thorough. Walilahi uh, alhamd. I think that should be it with regards to the specifics of the book. The quotes, the notable quotes. Now, and the sins of the book. At the end, we will give the translation, inshallah. Uh, I will give them, to be honest and to be fair, uh, four out of five, four and a half quills out of five. It's a very good grade, I'll that. Four and a half. Four and a half quills out of five quills. So therefore, in brief, if you see this book online, if you see it in the store, you're definitely going to what? Pick it up, read it, benefit from it, study it. It doesn't mean that the book is perfect. No book is perfect except for the Quran and No book. Nothing after the Quran is 100% perfect. Period. But it's a very good for a book. Those cons, those sins are a few examples from about what? 807 pages. These are one or two, 10 out of 800 is still what? Left 20. There were 20 mistakes out of 800 pages. It's still what? Very good. Very good. So don't no one take it to the extreme that we're just bashing the author just for the love and the sake of bashing for that. Everyone understand this? So pick up the book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should know best. Jazakum Allah khairan. Until the next session on Hadith Disciple Critical Book Review. Cool. What was that? Uh, there was an issue just a couple days ago here. Uh, a few brothers, they were having an argument in regards to weed, marijuana. They said how marijuana is permissible and it's from the earth. And the Salaf used to take it to relax themselves. And they said that it's it's not processed. You could just take it from the ground and just smoke it. And, and like Motrin, Tylenol, these are made from cocaine and all these drugs. Those are like heroin, rather. Marijuana or something Allah gave. So so they were basically saying it's permissible. But it, what's the true understanding? Is it permissible or is it impermissible? 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Question says, a few days ago, some brothers in the masjid, they had a debate or an argument, or not an argument, you know, a conversation on marijuana. Some people, you said weed, the word you use, but it has many names, marijuana, weed, pot, Mary Jane, skunk, <laughs> etc. And the reason why, this is very important as well, this thing's the answer, is that marijuana has been around for a very long time in many different cultures, many different usages, marijuana, hemp, etc., grass, etc., huh? And this is one of the reasons why it has so many names. And this is a very important fact, though, in general. I'm not, not being funny. Anything that has 20 nicknames, 50 nicknames, is something that has an integral part of society. This is a fact, though. We're taught a little. An integral part of society that's been around for a long time has several what? Names, money, cash, cream, cheese, paper. chicken, dough, paper, chemical bankings, butter, bread and butter. Bread and butter, I never heard that one. Uh, play it, scrub, scratch, flus, chips, chips, huh? Bands, <laughs> rats, stats, big faces, dead presidents. This is reality. This is not being funny. This is real. Which shows you that the concept of wealth, people dying, people worshiping it, trading is what? Is a stable part of what? Society. Of society. Everybody understand this? Different names and titles for all the things. Sexual intercourse. It's known. Parts of the human anatomy. How many names are there for this part of a person's body? For this part of a woman, for this part of a man. The concept of intercourse. There's a million names for it. Is that everybody from the black to the white, the yellow to the red, the north to the south, east to the west, they all have what? Sexual intercourse. Reproduction. Everybody says it's important. So therefore, marijuana has been around for a very long time. And it's a very deep issue. And this is going to have a direct effect on the what? On the answer. On the what? On the answer. Everybody doing this? So before we even start talking about getting into the concept of marijuana and weed, is it permissible, is it impermissible, is it haram? Is it the devil's weed, etc.? We say is that a Muslim is prohibited from speaking about that which he has no knowledge. Imam, scholar, mufti, kali, ami, layman. If you don't have the proper knowledge, then you are not to speak about these things. What I talk for my said I can be here. Allah says, do not approach, don't go near. Don't come close to that which you have no knowledge of. Why not? Because what you listen to, what you see, your heart, all of these things, man, is going to be what? Question about. Asked about. Man, will be asked about these things, huh? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Allah mentions to the Prophet, والسلام, what my Lord has made unlawful is what? Fawahish. Lewd, indecent things. That which is public, that which is private. What if my what the greater hawk sin and transgression unjustly now nah? to make sure with the law that which you have no so thought no authority of no knowledge of huh when to hold on Allah and for you to say about a law that which you do not know Ibn Qayyim Allah mentioned speaking about a law without knowledge is the greatest sin in Islam the greatest sin in Islam worse than shirk because Allah mentioned Fahisha Ethan Bugi, shirk, and at the end he said what? Why to hold on Allah? Not a ta'alimun. So he said that's the greatest sin. And shirk and kufr is nothing more than a result and a product of speaking about Allah without knowledge. Huh? Saying that Allah is a son. Who told you that? Where did you get that from? What knowledge do you have to say that Allah is a son? I have to go to this grave for my God to be answered, to be accepted. Wearing this around my neck, around my arm, right next to my foot is a means of shifa. Who told you that? The Rasul? The kitab, you speak my law without what? Knowledge. Uh, knowledge. So shirk and kufr are results and fruits of what? Speaking my law without ilm. Hmm? Now, and there are many other ayats in the Quran and Kareem that deal with impermissibility and the severity, the gravity of what? Talking about a law without, without, huh? Knowledge. Without ilm. So it's important for the Muslim to avoid this. If you're a student of knowledge, you don't have the proper ilm, keep silent. We can research. We can study, we can ask, we have a book in front of us, but to just talk idly. It's not haram, 
It is haram. It's kada, it's kada. It has to be what? Totally avoided. Sorry. Talking about marijuana, talking about salah, talking about salah's a deen. Any shit in the deen. Without the proper hidden, you must keep silent. And even if you do have knowledge, or the proper knowledge, you shouldn't just be talking like a cow chews. A cow just sits and chews, a panda bear eats and eats and eats bamboo. You know how much a panda bear eats in a day? You'd be shocked how much it eats. It just chews and bites and crunches all day long. That's how many people are, they just talk, 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 talk. Nah, that's not the way of the little man. It's not the way of the people hadith. Relax, slow down, take it easy. Even if you do have some type of ilm, just you shouldn't what? Talk about so much all of the time. So that's general advice. Having nothing to do with marijuana and weed. We could have missed, inshallah, we could have missed. The next step is uh, a thing being haram or halal is not just based off of it being natural or unnatural. Something is synthetic, something comes from chemicals, something is man made, something comes from a laboratory, something comes from the ground. That is not the determining factor of halal and haram. There are things that are lawful, that are synthetic, with chemicals in them. And there are things that are haram, which are natural. That is not mantiki. That's not logical speech. Just because something natural is what? Ah. Just because something is man-made, it's haram. No. No scholar, no student knowledge, no one with common sense thinks like that. And anyone who does think like that, something seriously wrong in his mind. It's permissible just because it's natural. It's haram just because it's it's bottom. Zina. Man-made or natural? Natural. Which of the two? Natural. Without a doubt. Is it permissible to sleep whatever you want to sleep with? No. It's false. Poison. Poisonous mushrooms. Poisonous shrubs. All types of different natural things from the earth. Is it permissible to eat them and drink them? They'll kill you. But it's what? Natural. It's natural. A wild animal attacks you. And a, huh? a wolf, a timber wolf. Natural or unnatural? Natural. I understand this. Having a dog as a pet. Dog natural, man made, genetically bred. Which of the two? Natural. Natural. Doesn't mean it's what? Commercial. Ah. So it's false. It's about to mean the same way from that. That logic is what? Bad. Now, let's get into the core nitty gritty of the issue. Marijuana, is it permissible? Is it impermissible? If someone says that marijuana is haram, then they say it's haram for several reasons. Number one, they classify it as kum. They classify it as an intoxicant. It's not a drink, it's not necessarily wine or liquor, but it's an intoxicant, something that gets you high, that plays with your mind, that clouds your eyes, clouds your vision, clouds your aqal. Has an effect upon your akhlaq. Everybody understand this? You may say or do something that is against yourself, against another human being, against the law and its rasul. It intoxicates. So those who say that's haram, they classify it as haram because it's what? It's An intoxicant. It's haram. Number two, they may say that marijuana is haram because it has a profound effect on your behavior and your character. Some say that it causes men to act feminine. Some say this. Uh, some say it causes a person to behave foolishly. And just because something makes you act foolishly doesn't mean that it's an intoxicant. So it's not, that, or, uh, it's not reiterating the first point. Huh? And others may say it's a waste of time, a waste of money, an addiction. It's, it's habit causing. Huh? And some they may say that it's a means of foul smell. It's a means of making your fingernails look a certain way, your lips look a certain way, your teeth look a certain way, your lungs, your throat your tongue, it may cause what? Cancer. And these things are prohibited. Destruction of oneself, killing yourself, your body is in a manner that Allah gave you. Allah prohibited us from killing ourselves. Huh? So these are the main points that they may say why marijuana is what? Haram. And all modes of its usage. Smoking it, vaping it, etc. Everybody understand this? What? Etc. Khair inshallah. Uh, with, regard, with details with regards to vape and the vapor, we don't get into that right now. Now, some brothers who say it's permissible, or some people may say it's permissible, perhaps they counter those agenda, those evidences. And they say, if you say that weed is haram and marijuana is haram, then your Advil, your Motrin, your Leave, your Advil PM, 
and all these other Percocets and Zantex and this and that are also haram because they are what? Intoxicants, they're khum, they get you high as a kite, cloud nine. Uh, high as a pigeon in the morning. Everybody understand this? Now, what does the first person want to say? How is he going to refute that? Regardless whether it's used as medicine, regardless whether it's administered by the health, by the FDA, but it's but regardless of those things, it they may say, Can you agree with me, Aki? Smoking a joint, a blunt, huh? A reefer, a, 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 a spliff, whatever you call it. Huh? That gets me high. And taking two pills also. Regardless of where it comes from, how they make it, and why I'm using it, huh? that's another argument. But we can both agree that it both causes me to feel a certain way. So if weed is haram, how can you take the pills? And they obviously intoxicate me as well. I can't drive when I take these, this medicine. It puts me to sleep. It makes me feel like I'm flying in the sky. I can't feel my face, as they say. Is this not the case? So then that, the first deal is going to be problematic. It's going to be what? Problematic. problematic. And the, the second, the woman says that weed is haram, he's going to have to do one of the following. Number one. He's going to admit that point, and he's going to uh, follow the view that we is allowed, persist saying that we is haram, and accept contradiction and hypocrisy. He's going to have to what? Accept contradiction and what? Hypocrisy. Lack of consistency in argument. Why is this haram, but that's permissible? I'm not saying that all pills cause intoxication, but they don't. And those who say that, they're wrong. All painkillers do not cause intoxication, but some do. Everybody understand this? That's a hub out. Many people they say that. Pills get you high. All pills do not get you high. Weed does what? Get you high. Everybody understand this? Everybody understand this? The next point, number two, they may counter their argument by saying that weed is natural. Not saying this because natural is permissible, but those pills are man-made. They're manufactured. They have all types of harmful effects upon the body, upon the mind, upon the liver, upon the spleen. They are also habit causing. They're also addictive. When a person is hooked on those pills, even if it's small pills, he loses soul. The first thing you do when you get a migraine is what? First thing you do when you get tired, this, this hurts you, do what? Pop a pill. You don't mention all his name, you don't make dua, you don't try to go to sleep, take your mind off it by reading the Quran, you do what? Pop, 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 pop. So if marijuana is habit causing, then pills are also habit causing. If marijuana is a waste of money, it's something that's costly, then those pills are also costly. Costly. Let alone rebound, interest, insurance. You can't get certain pills unless you have a plastic card. And then this goes on. Everybody understand this? Everybody understand this? Uh, the concept of the throat, the nails, you know, they say pills have bad effects as well. Marijuana is natural. Everybody understand this? So, the core issue is this. Number one. Is it permissible to take an intoxicant for medicinal usage? If you say yes, and if you say no. If you say yes, you can take a Percocet or whatever other pill, then you're also going to say you can use some type of model, regardless whether it's smoking or not. But the general concept of the Khamma, taking it for what? Severe pain and agony and suffering. And if you say that it's haram, you cannot use them at all. Khamma is a sickness in itself, as the Hadith states. Allah has not placed your cure and illness, then you're going to say both the marijuana and the pills are what? Both of them. Because they both cause damage, they both habit causing, they both are addictive, and this goes on. Everybody understand this? A third person, he may come in the middle and he may say, smoking weed is haram. Not because of the weed, but because of the smoke. And what it causes, what it does to one's body. As far as using weed in an oil, hemp, Brownie. vaporizing it, a pill, this and that, that does not cause the damage that smoke causes, then some might say it's what? They could say it's what? Permissible. permissible. Whether it's absolutely permissible or restricted to severe cancer, severe pain, severe agony. Mm -hmm. A person has severe nerve damage and they're in constant pain. If they take a pill, they just light it like a vegetable. You can't do nothing like and if they take the marijuana through vapor or through oil or through some type of food, then they can have some type of life they can live. So some people, they may use what? Details. They may give a what? A detail. A detail. Mm. Last but not least is learning the history of marijuana. As we said about those different names and titles, what is the history of marijuana? 
Why is marijuana and weed such a bad thing culturally, socially? But pills that come from morphine, that come from marijuana, that come from the poppy seed, that come from opium and all of these types of major drugs, why are they accepted? Why are they used? Why is it so okay to take these major types of drugs in a bottle, but you can't smoke it? Or you can't vaporize marijuana? Why not? Everybody saying this? Before we go on further, one last detail, very important, is that those who say there are different types of marijuana. Marijuana, they have different levels of uh, the actual chemical ingredient that causes the intoxication, THC, whatever they call it. All types of marijuana are not the same. Some types of marijuana are specific for medicine. Specific for healing, specific for damaged nerves. Other types of marijuana are specific for other things. Certain types of treatment, certain types of development of the plant takes out the intoxication and leaves the healing in the medicine. And this is something which a person can argue and say has been medically proven in recent studies. But why recent studies? Why is it a new discovery to certain people? That is something that you have to read about, the history of marijuana in the United States. The history of marijuana in the United Kingdom. The concept of Christianity, Christian values, and weed. In brief, I'm not going to give you a lecture. The concept of weed in the past, it was looked down as something to be a means of paganism, heathenism. I have a worshiper who smoked weed. And the good book, and the people of the good book, and the church, and Jesus Christ, was something that were against that thing. And those who did use weed were normally people that were what? Lower class. Lower class people. Everybody understand this? Indigenous people. Because marijuana was used as a drug for spirituality. High priests smoked it, did different things to take them to a spiritual trance. Elevated them with their gods and their deities, etc. So obviously you have a European settler, someone colonizing the country. First and foremost, you're cursed because you're a descendant of Ham. Whether you're black or whether you have any color in your skin, Indian, black, you're not white, and you're automatically what? Cursed. Cursed. That's the first concept. You're what? Cursed. Cursed. There's a Christian values now. Most Christians. You're automatically cursed if you have any type of pigmentation in your skin. Uh-huh. That's number one. Number two is that not only are you cursed, in the good book, the Bible says that you're cursed, which allows slavery, oppression, rape, because you're cursed. You're not even a real human being. You're half of a human being. So everything from your way, from your culture, from your religion, from your practice is generally rejected based off of Christianity. And it's one of the things that happened with regards to him and marijuana. Opium was accepted. The things that came from opium were okay, but not from the devil's plant. Because that's what these people used to smoke in Central America, or South America, or Mexico, or in Africa, or in East Asia. Everybody understand this? So who are the people that formed the society, that made the laws, they made the hospitals, they created the modern banking system, except for what? White Christians, white Christians. The Templar Knights, they say, made the modern banking system. Huh? All types of laws, restrictions on guns, narcotics. You read the history of them, nine out of ten of them are based off of racism. One of the main reasons, not the only reason, but one of the main reasons why the gun laws in America is racism. It's to allow certain people to have guns, a slew of guns, or a ton of guns, and other minorities not to have what? No guns. When cocaine was permissible in America, when heroin was permissible in America, it was unlawful and impermissible for black people. Whites could smoke cocaine, could do things with cocaine, not black people. Because the whites were responsible for cocaine, and the blacks were savage animals. And the same applies to weed. The also the concept of weed, of hemp. And if you read the ancient history of, of Britain, you'll find when they dealt with it, and when it was abrogated and canceled. And when they totally issued an order to get rid of it, and it is uh, the, the, the weed of the devil. That's one of the reasons why I call it weed. Everybody saying this? So is weed haram because it's haram of Kitab Sunnah? But pills are permissible? Or is weed haram because you don't even realize you've accepted these Christian, Mushrik, Viking, sun god worshipping values? Everybody understand this? So if you say that weed is haram, then that's based on Kitab Sunnah. And be careful of being tricked mentally in something that is acceptable but unacceptable. Everybody understand this? The concept of polygamy. Why is polygamy so bad? Why is it looked down upon? Uh, why can't a man, a man marry a younger woman? Why is it so bad for an older husband and a younger woman? Why? What is the reason why if I ask you? 
Why can't an older man marry a younger woman? Why not? It was against their, their uh, core values. Core values. Why? So what's bad about an older man marrying a younger woman? She's not old enough. She's not old enough for what? Consent. Sex. Consent. Consent. Or sexual intercourse. Or right. children. children. What's so bad about the concept of pedophilia? And what defines and determines pedophilia? What's so bad about it? What's the main vice about it? She can't the person hasn't reached a decision making stage. She can't make a decision. Or? She can't protect herself. She can't protect herself from what? From the harm. You said marriage. It's marriage. This is marriage. This is not the right answer. You guys know the answer, but you're not giving it. What's so bad when a child is molested? Raped, something is done, taking advantage, of. taking advantage of, mm -hmm. against her will, things like this. Everybody saying this, but it's, it's much deeper than just consent. How about human damage? It's, it's all types of damage. In other words, one could hypothetically say, if all of these things are done away with, what remains of immorality? What is immoral about older and younger? What, what remains? She's old enough. She's given her consent. Her mother, her father, her guardians, they have allowed this. She's not being molested. She's not being raped. She's not being taken advantage of. If you remove all of these things, what remains of, of harm? Nothing. Everybody saying this? Ten-year-old girl at school, nine-year-old girl at school, she's molested by the teacher. That's not her husband. Her father, her mother knows of none of that. He is taking advantage of her. Fourteen years old, sixteen years old, sexually raped, he's doing what? Taking advantage, taking advantage of her. Is that the same as a young girl whose father, whose mother, whose wife say we marry you to our young daughter with our consent? And she we, she also gives our consent, no matter how young she is. Or she's physically capable of sexual intercourse at whatever age, 12, 15, depending on the girl, depending on the time, depending on how gentle the husband's going to be. It could be a grown man who could be rough and brutal with a grown woman and injure her sexually. She could be a grown 19-year-old girl, 25-year-old woman, and he could be what? And he could injure her and damage her sexually. The virgin or not? Is this not probable cause? So if all of these harms and vices, let's hypothetically speak, if they're all removed from the table, what remains of, the, of it being a bad thing? Except for the what? Cultural. Christian values. Polygamy and all types of wise alcohol accepted. But weed's so bad, such a bad thing. Weed is evil. What is alcohol? It destroys your kidney, your liver, your tongue, your lips, your body. You beat up your wife, you crash a car, you spend money on gambling, you make zina, you get a disease. Come on, it's evil. Yet it still is an integral part of the Christian society. There is not an occasion of meeting it unless there's what? Come on. So how is this now? Everybody see the contradictions? So oftentimes, many Muslims, they need to reevaluate some of these rulings and some of these thoughts. I'm not saying we just them, but just in general, they need to reevaluate. And you need to sit down and flush your mind of all of these Christian aqaid that have taken dominance over how you look at life. Why is it a bad thing to do this and do that? And the hypocrisy and, the, and the, the contradiction of the Christians with regards to slavery. When it came to slavery, the Bible promotes slavery, condones slavery. Ishmael had slaves. Ahab, this one, that one, Job, Jacob, Florence, they all had slaves. So therefore, that's why they have slaves. But the other values of the book of the Bible that they don't follow, such as pork, such as Christmas trees, such as wigs, such as covering, and let's go home. Everybody understand this? So there's a lot of contradiction with regards to these different things. Don't take it from me. It's not something I'm giving to you from my pocket. Read yourselves the history of marijuana in this country and outside of this country. Read for yourselves the usages of hemp, the many usages of hemp in America, in the UK, in the old world, the ancient world. Read about it. And read when it became what? Bad thing. When it was looked down, when it was condemned. Everybody understand this? And you'll find many shocking points of evidence. So that's what I feel on the issue. There has to be detail. You cannot just give a black and white ruling. Permissible to take pills? Sometime. Some pills. It may be, I said, it may. I said, it may be permissible to take some types of medicinal marijuana at what? At times. It has to be detailed. But if you just give a black and white ruling, you're going to fall into all types of contradiction. 
And you want to look stupid when you actually scientifically deal with things like this, historically. And I said, do not underestimate propaganda. Do not underestimate what? Propaganda. And from the propaganda is Christian propaganda. They make you think a certain way. They program you. That's all about this. Illuminati, conspiracy theories. We're talking about reality. And if, if you don't believe this, then between me and between you are the what? Books of history. That they wrote themselves. Any other questions? Yeah, Brother Ray. It says, what is the ruling when one says, Wallahi, for something, and he breaks it? Does one have to fast three days? If you say, Wallahi, for something, and you break it, it depends on what you meant. If you just intended to say, Wallahi, then that's one thing. You call it a man of level. Or the uh, 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 level, level, you mean? You mean a level. Huh? If you meant Wallahi, actually making a vow, I swear, and you break it, then you have to do a vow to another. You have to do a vow to a man. You have to make an expiation of your yameen. Of your what? Of your yameen. The swore of the swearing that you made. Which is what? For kafara to who? Feed what? Ten people? Or? Ha, ah, that's the last thing. Freedom. Emancipation of a slave. Or? For men and men, for Siyamu, for Three days. Um, when you pray and you're following someone who's saying a prayer out loud, in the first two rakah, they say it out loud. The last three or four are the last two. Mm -hmm. Do you recite to yourself? As far as the first two rakah, then the correct view in Allah is best. The view of many of the regular map slam is that you should keep silent behind the Imam. Do not recite while the Imam is reciting out loud. As far as while the Imam recites silently, then you should recite silently. Salat al Dur reciting on four. Salat al Asr reciting on four. Salat al Isha reciting the last two. Salat al Nawr reciting the last two. At least the Fatiha. The Fatiha. Mm -hmm. And then the last two. As far as Salat al Isha in the first two, Salat al Asr, Salat al then the view that makes the most sense in the law, so I thought should know best, is that one should keep silent. I want to put in for silent. If I send your rule, I will answer to you. I look to Hamon. Allah says, keep silent and listen, perhaps that you will receive mercy. Shaykh Islam, Tami, Rahimah, and many others mentioned, many of the Salaf al they said, Nazarat, ah, Fakirati Khalf al Imam. This verse was sent down regarding the Salah and praying behind the Imam. And it only makes sense. What is the fatiha of you reciting and the man is reciting? How can you listen to the Quran? How can you ponder on the Quran? And then they say, well, recite after the man when the man keeps silent. What if the man doesn't keep silent? Some men don't take a pause, they go right into the surah. Or what is the point of you saying from the devil on the man the man came rushing before he starts for Shem Salahaha? You recite the fatiha like a speed race. What's the fatiha of that? Pondering. Everybody understand this? And some of them, they say that it's permissible to recite before the imam starts reciting if he has no second text. There's no time to be silent. And that's also mushkila because now you're not following the imam, but you're actually preceding the imam. So all of these different context clues show us, and Allah knows best, is that the strongest view is that you should keep silent behind the imam when he recites out loud. I wrote doing this, but that's not necessarily the safest view. The safest view is that you recite the Fatiha. Because those who are not will say that this man truly say there's no salah unless you recite the fatiha. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the strongest view. Just because it's the safest view doesn't mean it's what? The strongest. That's in brief, obviously. That's what? In brief. Well, all right. Next question on line. Question says, can a woman pat water on her hijab during wudu when she's busy or time is close to the next prayer? Wolf glass on her head? Yeah. Obviously, it seems that she was talking about her head. Can a woman pat water over her wudu? Can a woman make a mess on her head? We say yes, inshallah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing wrong with that. Whereas a woman is similar to a man, a woman's kimar is similar to a man's head covering, let alone what some of the Sahabi yet used to do. Allah ta'ala, inshallah, nothing wrong with that. Be in that. Follow.
Our question says, with regards to the eclipse, is it mandatory? How do you make it? So on and so forth. We say, Bidinillah, that the eclipse, Salat al Khusuf, and some say Khusuf, Sonar or Lunar, hmm? Sonar or Lunar, it's not mandatory, Bidinillah, to reckon an act to be made in congregation. As far as how is it to be made, there is a difference of opinion among the people of knowledge. Everyone understand this? Some of them say to Raqqa with four Rukua. We recite the Fatiha in a long surah, make a Rukua, come out of Rukua, and what? Recite again for a long time, but not as long as the first Raqqa. Go down, finish the Salah, come back up, make a Rukua a third time, come out of Rukua. Again, so how many Rukua? Four. And? Some of the Willamatic say, this is the most sound way of doing it. And there are other views. Wrong defense of opinion of regards to how to make it. So that's a simple, easy way for you to do. They didn't ask my own time. What about Reciting the, out loud. the woman at home? What do they mean? Well, it's made in congregation. It's not made by yourself, as we just said. That, yeah, so the, the, the eclipse is made where? In Jama'ah, in congregation. Jama congregation. A call for it is to be made, the man, so on and so forth. Now, it's made where? Okay. In the congregation, just like the prayer of the rain. Well, I'll tell you, that's obviously what? And breathe. Fuck on. Our brother owes a lot of brother money, and the brother said, and the, he's renting out the house. And the sister, the brother's sister lives there, so he said, if you don't pay me the money, I will make a conspiracy against you to say that you try to molest my sister. So the brother texted the brothers. Now he has the evidence that he try, he's trying to create the story against him. So what should he do? Should he go to the authorities or the Muslim, the guy who's threatening that he's going to say that he Muslims did? Muslims don't threaten people. It's not the way we saying. It's not the way we're saying to threaten. Who are you to threaten? Man enter. Hata to hide the nas or to call from. Man enter the dalik. Who are you to threaten somebody? You're a poor, poor slave of law. Man enter hata to hide the nas. It's not a shame. Threatening Muslims is not Islamic. You can warn a Muslim. You can advise a Muslim. You can threaten them with a law. Taqillah, shaykh. It's haram. They Jews. Allah hates this. But your physical harm, you shouldn't do that. Huh? Because the Muslim is the brother of the Muslim. And who are you? If you want to threaten somebody, then somebody can threaten you and beat you up and blackmail you. How many skeletons do you have in what? Your closet. Your closet with clothes on. So this is to be avoided. Don't threaten anybody. And anybody who threatens you is not a thorough person. You're not a good, strong Muslim. Strong Muslims, strong men, strong women, they don't threaten people. Why is people don't threaten people? If I intend to do harm to you, I'm not going to threaten you. Because once I threaten you, you're going to be prepared. If I want to do harm to you, I'm going to either do the harm to you, or I'm going to keep you heedless and unaware that I, it's going to come. Have a good day, Yusuf. Thank you very much. Oh, I slipped, I fell. Don't worry about it. So next time you see me, you're not going to have your guard up. There. Wham! Got you. <laughs> Never expected that. But if I threaten you, then you're always what? Looking out for me. So that's not even from Hikmah. Not even Islam. Be merciful to your Muslim brother. Warn your Muslim brother. Advise your Muslim brother. Don't threaten your Muslim brother. Black man and people. Then you're lying. Making accusations of rape. And, uh, what is this? Go be a Christian if you want to do these things. Why? Well, There's no room in Islam to do these things. To make scandal against people and lie. That's not Islamic. Everybody saying this? Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Allah sent down a whole surah about these types of people. They don't watch what they say with their tongues, who gossip, who say these types of evil things with their tongues. Is everybody saying this? Al Muslimu man say, al Muslimu man in Isani, wa yadihi. You have to be safe from your Muslim brother, his tongue, and his hand. Everybody understand this? You're threatening someone, you're intending to make up a lie, to fabricate a story, accuse someone of rape, and this and that. It's severe. It's severe. We all have little punishments of talking falsehood and accusing Muslims of that which they are free from. And some hadiths tell us there is a special place in hell, a Raghwat al Khabat, a special, future, terrible valley in the Jahannam for those who talk about Muslims and say things that are not true about those Muslims. So that is evil. It's evil. Calling the authorities, you've got to physical fight with your brother, this and that, that's not as bad as what? Threatening. Tahdeed. And it's very bad. Many people that do this and they attribute themselves to knowledge. And it's not their fault. They have different brothers in the West 
whom uh, they do this, they threaten their brothers. If you don't take it back, we're going to warn against you. If we don't take it back, we're going to do this. If you don't go, if you go to this conference, you're not going to go to the, you're not going to come back to our masjid. Wallah, if you do this, you're not going to do kada. Wallah, if you say this, then kada. If you don't disassociate yourself from him, then kada. These people are masakeen. They're poor people. They're poor, small, simple-minded people. It's not their fault. They've been miseducated. They've been taught ill and ill men incorrectly. They're poor. They're pawns. The evil people are those who are behind them. Those who move those pieces on the chessboard. Who teach them and instruct them to threaten another Muslim. Your fellow brother who may be just as knowledgeable as you may be more knowledgeable. Just experience as you may be more experienced. They have better things he's done for Islam and for a sunnah. But you threaten him. Threatening people about other than Allah. Allah talks about this in the Quran. And that they cause you to have fear of those who are besides Allah. Huh? That's not to he. You don't threaten people. Allah. The question says, is it permissible? For a Muslim to take medication to reduce sexual desire, if the Muslim has a high sexual desire, and a person is married and tried and tried fasting, but it is not helping to reduce the desire. I wouldn't advise any Muslim to take medicine <laughs> <laughs> or any type of herbs, natural or unnatural, with regards to your sexual desire. I would advise for you to take that sexual desire that Allah has placed in you and use it in a permissible means. If you're married, get another wife. Sister. If it's a sister, she needs to advise her husband. Uh, no, honestly. Hit the gym. Whatever. Allah Allah. Gym, what you eat, what you drink, out of him is the husband has to give her her what? Her rights. Her rights. Allah says, huh? This is not funny, Allah. This is a serious issue that many people they complain about. Allah says and women have similar rights to those that the men have over them. So just as a man has the right that his wife gives him a heart and his sexual desires in a permissible way, when he wants them, the husband should do the what? The same. And in many brothers, unfortunately, they may be afflicted with impotence. This is reality, will I? I can tell you and show you things that you wouldn't believe. Sisters, complain, contact, emails, phone calls about their husbands, being impotent, having a disease, having a sickness, or not being impotent, but just don't please them sexually. Don't, they don't care. So what? I'm, I'm not in the mood. Or they may not have the physical ability, the stamina, the length, whatever the case may be. So that's not a problem. That's something that Allah decrees upon a person. The mushkid is for you not to find a way. Not to find a way to fix yourself, to enhance yourself. But if a woman had an injury with her body, if there was something wrong with her sexual organ, if she did not have sexual desires with Allah, you will complain. You will complain. You wouldn't be patient upon it. You wouldn't allow it. Something's wrong, go to the doctor. We say, go to the doctor. See what's wrong. What's the problem? On the other hand, I don't feel like it. This and that. That's wrong. That's good. Your wife in Islam is also your sister. And the Prophet says, you can't believe until you love for your brother what you love, what? For your sister. And their rights that they have are similar to the rights that you have over them. So therefore, if a sister has a problem with regards to her sexuality, she's hypersexual, whatever the case may be, then she should speak to her husband. She should talk to her husband. And she should be honest. She shouldn't go shouldn't anything. And she tell her husband that I'm displeased. I'm not pleased. You're not giving me enough of my rights. Please give me more. How, the way, what you do, what's permissible, what's impermissible. Anything that's halal, fi hudud al jets. That's in the, the, the boundaries of permissibility should be done. I don't want to do that. No, I don't feel comfortable with that. The sister should say to her husband, if it's not haram and I like it and it pleases me, it satisfies me sexually, then you should what? He should do it. As long as it isn't haram. She asks for something that's unlawful, according to Allah's messenger, Marish, different story. Can't, I can't help you out. You have to get another husband. But if it's permissible, but culturally looked down upon, or just not your style, or whatever the case may be, and you want to please this woman, she's your wife, then you should what? You should do it. Why should you do it? Because of what we just quoted in the Quran. If you wanted your wife to do a sexual act, and she was displeased with it, 
and she was uncomfortable with it, what would the husband do? One of two things. He would either complain or he would get it in her arm. There's no lie about that. He's either going to complain about it, divorce her, beat her, leave her alone, or he's going to get it in the what? In the heart, in the streets. There's no lie about that. So why doesn't the rule apply also to the? Huh? Everybody understand this? This is a very important concept that many men, they have twisted, warped understanding. Everybody understand this? So a Muslim man is a Muslim man who should be thorough in everything. Your deen, your akhlaq, providing for your wife, taking care of your wife, and also handing you your business as a Muslim man. That's from the sunnah. If you don't have the ability, then learn, study, get someone to teach you what to do, how to do, to please your wife. Because if you do not please her, there's a big possibility that she may fall into sin. And if she falls into sin, not only is it your fault, you're going to get some of the sin. What the Allah did, we're going to talk about what the Allah did. I think you're going to do it. Do not cooperate upon sin and transgression. Secondly, the sin that she makes may have a profound effect on you. She may bring back a child that isn't your child. She may bring you back a disease that will kill you. She may bring shame and dishonor to your name, to your family, to your household, to your bed. Because you did not fulfill your manly responsibilities. So it's not a small, simple issue. Wallahu ta'ala alam.